There we go. Um, great. Would um, someone like to um, make a motion uh, to open the meeting? Move to open the meeting. Second. Any discussion? All in favor, Suzanne? Yes. Cynthia? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Um, okay. Um, is that Mr. Tebow that you have with you, Amy? It's, um, it's Mike Tebow of 15 Hebert Avenue, and he has his friend and advocate, Diane, with him. Great. So we won't make him sit through the review of our minutes. We'll rearrange our agenda so we can get right to his hearing. Um, so, um, Mr. Uh, Dr. Levin? Yes. We need to make a motion to open up the hearing. Yes. Okay. Yes. Great. Um, so, Mr. Thibault is, pre uh, is present. I uh, had requested a hearing. Uh, would someone like to make a motion to open the hearing? Move to open the hearing. Second. Any comments? Questions? All in favor, just, Cynthia? Just for the record, we might have to have Diane's last name. I don't I don't know. Um, you can have it, it's just long. It's Hedge Damowitz. That's why I don't usually say it. So as I, long as we yeah, as long as we have it on our recording. Thank you, Diane. Right. Uh, all in favor, Cynthia? Yes. Suzanne? Yes. Okay. Um so the hearing is now open. Uh, does a representative from the uh, DHHS want to summarize the um, the order? Yeah, I, I can do that. Um, this has been a process that we started back with um, Mike's mom in about September of 2022, where it was determined that he needed a septic system. His house had been um, it, built a long time ago and the system that was in place was not much of a system. So at that point, um, they started, his mom started looking for funds along with the uh, Michelle Dillman from the senior center. And at the same time, they started, they did a soil evaluation. It's, it's a perk test and they're looking at the soils that are in the conditions that are at that property. So at that time of that perk test, it was discovered that there's clay on 15 Hebert Avenue and that a traditional septic system wouldn't be allowed. It just, it, it, it's, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't work. So uh, they kind of put their thinking caps on, like what, what could he do then with, within this grant funding? And again, I, I'm going to refer to your mom at that point, right? Because yep, she yep. did the paperwork and um, uh, we took a look at through, it was kind of a multi-department interventions somewhat. And we, Took, to, took a look at what would it take to connect to city uh, city water sewer. Uh, actually, you have city water, city sewer. And he lives on a private way, 15 Hebert Avenue, off of South Street in Northampton. And it would go up a hill and, and to connect. So it, it makes it quite complicated in doing that. You need a pumping chamber and the, the connection and the the DPW work that would need to be done. It was really cost prohibitive, but also it wasn't covered in the grant, that type of work, given the private way. So we took the other avenue <laughs> of investigating um, what were the alternatives. And the other alternative was a tight tank. So a tight tank is a septic system. It's not allowed in new construction, but it is allowed for repair when the conditions aren't, aren't possible for a traditional system. And a tight tank would be kind of like just a container, like a septic tank. But it, it, and the difference is it doesn't leach out in, in a way that it, it, it would do traditionally. So it's like an untraditional uh, septic system. In looking at that, they continued continue with the paperwork of what that might look like, an application and a, and a plan was submitted, all kind of going in along the idea of what could be done for that property uh, in, within the grant. But one thing that came up uh, during you know, this application process was there's a cost to a tight tank um, where it's a monthly three to four weeks, sometimes a little longer. It, it's based on the use of the property. Um, and, and it's a lot. It can be, it's, it's kind of hard to determine ahead of time. You know, there would only be Joan living there. So there wasn't a lot of use, but the use is, 
you know, it's your kitchen sink, it's your bathroom sink, it's your showers, it's your dishwasher, your laundry, but it's also your, your excrement as well. So hard to tell what that was, but it could be anywhere between three and $800. That's a really rough estimate, but that also wouldn't be, it was an allowable expense for the grant. So we kind of got at a, hmm, here's where we're at. And did Joan Carcat have the funds, Michael's mom, to do, to do that? And it was, it kind of just kind of went, it landed. And at the same time, even though the process of the, the, the septic application process was moving, that kind of stalled. And then it was determined that the end of the grant came in June of 2023 and, and the funds were gone and distributed in a, in, in a list of, to other, other needs similar. Um, so at that point, it, it stalled a little bit. And at, at the kind of the same time, um, we were looking, Joan and the senior center was working with the senior center, uh, the senior center, Michelle Dillman uh, reached out to, um, excuse me, Highland Valley Elder Services, you know, to to have her uh, review of what type of services could be, be given to her. At that same time, let me just back up a little bit, missed a, an important piece, that at that time that it was determined that there wasn't a septic system there and that, that there was a, like a, um, a temporary solution of bringing a porta potty to the property. So there would be a means of, of having that available to them. You know, we talked as a um, city departments, like, you know, what type of grace period could we do until we could get Joan housing? And, and you know, how, how long would that take? And, and what could we do so we wouldn't put Joan, you know, uh, you know, in a situation of being houseless? So that typically was really uh, reviewed um, quite, quite regularly, but that, that was the reasoning kind of for the temporary solution. So fast forward a little bit as uh, Joanne, uh, Michelle Dillman and Joan, the owner, uh, uh, she's owner by a, like the state, right, Mike? Um, the senior center, Michelle Dillman, really worked hard to look for other, any avenues that could be quicker and sooner and, and get her on more wait lists. But there's, there's just not a lot that take um, vouchers that, that uh, Joan needed. And so she slowly moved up the, up the list, but also I'd have to say she'd be like, mm -hmm. I'm not going. Oh, and maybe I will go. So she she's you know a little bit working there all along the process to you know get to this move. So um, I I know that Mike in the past he had uh, some questions about what ha what happened to the grant and you know I, I you know asked the mayor's office can you please explain this to me in a little bit of a um, strong manner but. Um, we, we all came together as departments and, you know, tried to like, let's just, you know, keep this moving along and hopefully it's satisfying everyone. So then it came, and I hope I'm getting this timeline right, that um, it came to just a, a, about a few weeks ago, uh, Michelle Dillman reached out to me and said, she's, she's at the top of the wait list, you know, between last summer and here doing the application process that's needed and the doctor's approval and the screening at the later home. She was finally at the top of the wait list. And so myself and the mayor reached out to Mike and said, you know, please encourage her to, to make the move. You know, it's time we, you know, offered you a grace period, but this is available. And and when these um slots come become open at assisted living, you have this window and you need to make the move or you lose the slot and you go back to the bottom. So it was pretty a pretty much a, a tough week last week hoping she was going to make the move and she did thanks to, to Michael and encouraging her and Michelle Dillman as well. So she moved into the late home last Tuesday morning and um, at that point and I the mayor had had talked to you um, just saying that you know when he would ask questions I think he left you a message and you, you got back to him in a timely manner and said that you know, please encourage your mom to, to make this move. But at this time, it was time that we were going to, you know, have to, as city departments, move this forward in a condemnation. Um, and so we, we did do that that day. Uh, we went out to the house um, and uh, you, you were there. You were doing some work, um, in, in, a little inside and you're always in your garage. And uh, 
we sat down and we explained, you know, the, the bigger process, there's a lot to it, you know, the, the why, you know, I, I think Mike's had the question, you know, is my house, you know, I'm doing my best to, to, to improve it and work on it, but we really explained it's not the house. It's the fact that there's no septic system to the house. It's the the that that it's not in in repair. It's really not there. So so we've ex, you know explained the process to him, and that he can't be on the property. He can't he can't live there at, at that time of that condemnation last Tuesday, in the immediate order to vacate, and um, had lots of questions. But we kind of talked it through. From there. I provided some some of your septic, all your documentation to you the next day, and we had some more questions. And you know, I reminded him that he had you know the opportunity to be heard by the board of health. You know, any questions that he had, or if he disagreed with the condemnation, and he he wrote a letter and and got on your your um agenda. And that's kind of where we're at. And if you have any more questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, so, Mr. Thibault, um, do you have something you would like to say? Do you find that the um, information that we are, have received um, from the DHHS staff is correct? Um, is there anything you'd like to add? That what I what I what I want to do with that time. Um, they have um, they gave me certain times to be there, you know, and stuff when I can't be there. Um, the only way I can say is I work seven days a week, um, and it's hard for me to take care of the house and, and do things um, at five o'clock that they want me to leave. I, I would like if I could be extended till dark time, eight or nine, so I can get the, the grasses a mile high. To, I, I, I just want to be able to clean more, take care more. I put new porch on. I put new, some new windows on. Um, just something that I needed to get done. I like property clean. I'm very, everybody knows me, knows I'm, I'm a fanatic. So that, I guess that's what I'm asking, just some more time. It, it sounds like you're looking for like an extension. Right now we have seven to five. That's a traditional uh, yeah, I think, frame. I think that's what I'm, yeah. yeah. So Joanne, do you mind if I speak for a moment? Go ahead. This is a very typical request, especially for people who work. So we kind of do a, a dusk to dawn permission, mm -hmm. and that's okay because we don't want to set times because as the seasons change, those times change as well. So during the light hours, we never have a problem with that. I just wanted to provide that to you in the board. So um, can you write that in the order, change, change the orders, uh, the hours, or or how it's written in the order or that's just an understanding we can just get we can change we can do both mm -hmm. okay yeah. anybody have any questions or concerns about that really? oh, I have no problem at all. Mr. do you have any other concerns um not really as long as i can go to my house and clean it and do the things I need to do. Um, well, uh, so, can I just ask a question, just procedural? Um, the condemnation order would still be in effect, even if if this permission to to improve the property is granted. Is is that right? Do I have that right? That's correct, Cynthia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, the only way we can lift the condemnation order is if they have a sewage disposal system there. So they need to be in compliant with the, the laws. Mm -hmm. So our role tonight in the Board of Health in this hearing is um, not really to say yay or nay. The condemnation order is based on state regulations. Uh, but just if we heard any information that would change the facts on the ground, um, then we might be able to reconsider, but um, based on the state laws, um, it sounds like Mr. Debo is saying that he has no additional information um, for us that would change that condemnation order. Okay. Can I ask the, the implications 
of the oh. condemnation order besides what's in the letter? Are there any other that the house is not habitable? No one can be living there. Um, and if we were to extend the hours from dawn to dusk, that would allow Mr. Tebow to be on the property at that time, as long as he's not living there and staying beyond those hours. Are there other implications? No. Okay. Okay. But be, being on the property from dawn to dusk, does that limit the use of sinks and toilets, et cetera? during that time that the house is being repaired? Well, that's a very good question. We would have to, um, I think the porta potty would have to stay while the repairs are being made. And I, I think we would have to discuss a timeline. You know, I, we can't let it go on forever. And I think, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Donna, like the, the the condemnation starts like a one year timeline that we, um, if you're making progress, we talked a little bit about this, Mike, if he's making progress, keep in touch with us, let us know where you're at, um, at that one year mark. If we haven't heard, is that correct, Meredith? So there are implications um, when properties are condemned that if they're not in good standing with the state Santa Co sanitary code within a year, and there's no plan to get them in good standing, that the city could put a demo order to raise the property. I'm not saying that's what we do every time. Most property owners don't want that to happen and go through the process to make sure to stay in communication with us, to let us know their plan to get it in um, compliance with the state sanitary code. We did. We did talk about that. Like, again, we talked like be in communication, let us know what your plans are. And then at that year, if we didn't. Yeah, care, like to, um, when I'm there, did I take care of the property? I clean thing, do things. We want, remember to focus. It's not so much the, the grass or putting in stairs or windows, it's the, the, the septic. The on-site septic. That's what we want to see progress with. Is, is this uh, plan in writing in anywhere for Mr. Tebow to refer to or did an agreement that he signs or anything like that? No, actually, just based on the combination. But no, th there isn't. It's just been a, a conversation. Okay. I would just think if there are deadlines, um, uh, and, expect and expectations that, that it probably would be important that everyone have the the same verbiage that's um, understandable at the, at the beginning and then can be referred to throughout whatever period of time this would last. We, I think we could certainly write a summary from this typically the condemnation states what needs repairs need to be done which it does but i think it makes sense to put in that you know we would um want to hear any progress that you're making um and you know that the timeline it, it would be to make progress for be actually be in in repair um installed would be a, a year's time frame I think it would be important to mention the the agreement about a porta potty and also the agreement that no other gray water is to be um, mm -hmm. dispelled onto the property. And I can explain again. Okay. I, I just think it's it's important for everyone mm -hmm. to understand the agreement at the at the outset the progress that's expect, expected and the time limits, if there are any. And pumping of the um, porta potty. Right. So just clarification, um, Mr. Tebow said that his rationale for wanting to stay on the property 
is mowing and windows. Amy, you're saying the rationale for staying on the property is to install the tight tank. Do I have that right? The, the condemnation is like when we say you you're allowed to be there between the hours of five and seven. It's it's for the repair or the remediation of what we're condemning it for. So that would be installing that. Um, I think you know when Donna and I were talking and we talked to Mike, it, it he does have his you know his car and things there. He does want to maintain that property. Um, it made sense to to allow that that part of it. So if he, you know, wants to do some work to the home, that that would be okay. But the main reason he can do all the work to the home he wants, but it's, the, the main focus is to repair, install that tight tank. And just a question about the grant. Who is the grant from and who and how did it expire? Yeah, the, the grant was originally from PVPC. Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. Commission. It, was a, it was a CBD grant, Janet. Uh, sorry, me, Cynthia. <laughs> I was reading yeah. something to Janet. It was a CBD grant um, through Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, and they expire every year. And the CBD grant coordinator at that time, Keith Benoit, did reach out to um, Mr. T Boat's mom to let them know that it was going to expire. And did you want to move forward? with the tight tank or not, and she declined. So there was notice given. But did you say that it, there's a grant every year? Is there a new grant coming up? There's a uh, community block development grant money every single year. I'm not sure how it's allocated, who gets what. Um, that's that's not um, something that's known to me. We, before we came on, we talked about a few resources um, with Mike and, and, and Diane that we kind of pointed them back to PVPC and, and, uh, Highland Valley elder services, um, just for, you know, any just support in going through the process. Senior center was great. Um, we suggested he reach out to Michelle again, you know, for just the application process. And I think it's worth a mention, Amy, um, to, you know, to, provide oh. assistance and resources to Mr. Tebow. Maybe you can reach out to Court Klein, who's now the CBD grant coordinator, to see if there's funding available again this year and if they would be eligible if they decided to put the type tank in. Okay, and do we'll add that to your list. And is there any um, health harm or environmental harm or aesthetic harm? to delaying this process to any of the surrounding properties having, I, I just don't know where the property is. Well, I, I think I can answer your question. I mean, there's a port, of, port there's a port, of there's port of I'm not sure where the gray water is going. I can't assure you a hundred percent that there's no black water going where the gray water is going. Um, I don't think we've seen pumping records for the porta potty. I don't know how frequently that's getting pumped. There could be um, nuisance odors happening, you know, with hot summer months coming. I'm not sure. Um, maybe have Mr. There been, have there been any complaints from neighbors about that? Are there no. neighbors? No. Um. If I were a property owner, I would um, appreciate knowing the consequences of not showing any progress towards the goal of an acceptable um, sewage system at the end of one year. What What is the expectation if there's no progress towards that goal? You can put that together in that time summary. So that um what they mean is that they give me a year to make sure that we're done. Mm -hmm. I, I can I can do it before that. Mm -hmm. Step okay. the they, they, but, uh, tell them how often that's pumped out when they yeah, pump out. Um we're talking about that porta potty thing. They um ball 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 stool um comes once a week. Um, so I have to pay a, a monthly, so it's four times a month. 
but now that I don't, you know, don't use those facilities, I don't have to now. Um, I'm going to try to cut them down to maybe even once a month. I, I, is that okay with you folks? So it saves me money and it, I can put the money somewhere else towards my sewer thing. Yeah, if you find that it's getting full or if it's, you know, there's an odor, then you might have to do it more frequently. But I think with nobody living there full time, Mike, and you working full time, I don't think that's going to be a problem. Um, can I ask, you know, because we're concerned for you, always have been and been advocating for you every way we can. How much were you paying um, every time it was getting pumped out? I think it's... Um... It's two hundred a month. It's either, yeah, I think it's one seventy nine or two hundred. I don't know which one it is. It's okay. either one of those. I okay. can come and find out. No, so that's okay. I just want to know thereabouts because I'm trying to compare what that would look like if you had a tight tank. How much it's going to cost you to pump it out as well? I I, I don't like smell, so I spray it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the answer to Dr. Levin's question about have we had any complaints, neighbor complaints? I didn't hear that answer. Not officially to us, no. Okay, and the closest neighbor is um, feet away or? Pretty, pretty close. What would you call that? 500 feet. There's three, three, um, three dwellings on, the, on that street, on that private way. One is uninhabited at the end, and the other bike's in the middle, and then the other one is at the top, close to South Street. He's about halfway down and maybe 500 feet. And we're right now where the port of Hawaii is set up is on the back side of Mr. Tebow's property, so it's not it's not out front facing anybody else's. It abuts uh, the bike path. And just nothing to do with this particular case, but this private way sounds like it's in a unique location. Do the other homes have the same issue? We were talking about that. They're all a little different. They're all a little different. Um, yeah, but, but we're not going to go into the um, other homes. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions or comments, Mr. Tebow? Is there anything else you'd want to tell us? No. You don't have to, no. but do you have mm -hmm. anything else? Not that I can think of. Okay. Um, board members, any other questions or comments? No, we don't have to vote on this extension that Meredith's talking about, the time extension. And it sounds like Amy's going to draft up some type of agreement for the next year. That's something that's handled within the department, correct? Correct. It's just whether or not you're going to uphold the condemnation. That would be the vote. Oh, oh we do have to vote on that. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, any other questions or comments? Uh, would someone like to make a motion? Uh, move to uphold the condemnation. Uh, I second it. Do we need to get any more specific than that? <laughs> I, I don't know. Well, why, don't, why don't we just say with the um, amendment of the um, death to dawn, um, what do we call that? Allowing Mr. Tebow to be on property from dusk. Dawn, dawn to dusk. Dawn to dusk, sorry. <laughs> with that amendment. With that amendment, thank you. That, that, that daylight. <laughs> but that that amendment is only going to be effective for one year? Or what? Or is it in perpetuity? The, the condemnation order itself expires at one year, does it not? There, There's no official expiration date on that condemnation. It's kind of like the our internal... Okay. The, 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 yeah, these are kind of the details that mm -hmm. are, are nice to have uh, specified. I, mm -hmm. I thought it. I thought it was an automatic sunsetting at, at, at a year. So this is important to know. Well, I guess um, if 
we're upholding the condemnation order, but no one is moving on uh, any other action until a year has gone by and has had a chance to do the remediation, right? Right. Um, can I ask a question? Sure. Um, can I have like a piece of paper knowing that, um, so I know that when this thing starts from a year, just so I know, you know what I mean? Um, so I keep track of things like? Exactly. Um, so Amy there, we'll, we'll write it up for you so you'll have it in front of you and be able to keep track. Mm -hmm. I got mm -hmm. Okay. Mm hmm Okay. Um, so Suzanne, do you want to restate your um, motion? I I move to um, uphold the um, condemnation order with the amendment to extend the hours to the daylight hours of uh, dawn to dusk when Mr. Tebow is, is allowed on the property. Second. Any other questions or comments? Okay, all in favor? Suzanne? Yes. Cynthia? Yes. Joanne? Yes. yes. All right, thank all you, right. Mr. Tebow. Thank you for coming in and, and uh, explaining the situation. And um, Amy will be in touch, so you have something in writing. He thanks you. Okay. Good luck. Hello, to you. I'm just going to go off video for just a minute or so and I'm um, you. Okay. I'll be back. Okay. Thank you. Could I just ask Meredith one question? Um, how did this come to our attention? Uh, gosh, I remember going there. I think in 2019, about other issues and there was questions about um I think maybe a pipe or something. I'm not really sure. I'd have to I'd have to go back in our notes and see. Mm -hmm. So that stuff gets rectified sort of like when the property goes for sale, right? Because of Title Five. Is that pretty much well yeah normally but Amy did mention that there's one property vacant on the end because again you know the soils are the same across yeah. that whole property so they weren't able to get in you know a subsurface sewage system as well yeah. um so there is issues with that whole street and they were hoping that they could all kind of pool their resources and then tie in to the main you know the city sewer system but it was really just cost prohibitive mm. i'm not sure what's going to happen in the end um yeah yeah and it's a private way so we don't you know the city doesn't pay for that yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks. about how many condemned properties are there in the city i couldn't even begin to answer that okay. and like you said like a condemnation order could be left there in perpetuity as long as they're maintaining the property you know a lot of times we do ask you know what is your intention with the property because we don't want vacant properties um some of them go into receivership where you have someone with deep pockets to maintain the property until it you know they can sell it um there's all sorts of circumstances but i couldn't i couldn't tell you how many are condemned currently there's not a wetlands issue involved with these properties, is there? Not on Hebert, no. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I just wonder, since it's downhill from mm -hmm. South Street, mm -hmm. I was just curious about that. Okay. Yeah, the footprint of the property and the soil type is impermeable. So it's a small footprint, and then you have impermeable soils. Um, you can't put any I, uh, AI. No, that's artificial intelligence, <laughs> IA. <laughs> systems in it's really we're left with a tight tank and that's when we think about all the different types of um systems out there um we try to limit those the best that we can it has to be really circumstance uh, circumstantial for us to 
to allow that. Title V doesn't like those for good reason. Yeah, and I thank us to Don. You want to know why I was thinking why I said that twice? Because it's my mosquito brain, <laughs> right? That's, uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. Um, any other questions or comments about this? Thank you. Would uh, anyone like to make a motion to close the hearing? Move to close the meet the hearing. Uh, second. Not the meeting. I do want to comment outside of the hearing how nice it was to see the collaboration between the different departments and for my inspectional staff, Amy included, to really look at this with a, a human perspective mm -hmm. because we could have issued this condemnation order in 2022, but with the condemnation order comes an order to vacate and then we would displace his mom who would have had to go into a shelter at that point. And really it was not in her best interest to go into a shelter. Um, so we put a lot of thought and consideration as we always do. You know, sometimes just because we can doesn't mean we should. Um, and the interdepartmental collaboration with the senior center, with CBDG, um, with planning, it just, it's been amazing. Mm -hmm. And to get her really in a year and a half time from living in this property with a porta potty. And that wasn't ideal for her either, but it was better than being in a shelter into the Lathrop home, took a lot of work and a lot of trust building. It's an amazing work of the senior center too. I know from mm -hmm. our staff as well, but you know, they're, they're really confined for having events at the building. And it sounds like um, the senior center director went above and beyond. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so hold on one second. We just didn't finalize our yeah, vote. <laughs> All in favor of closing oh. the meeting. Suzanne? Hearing yes. Cynthia? <laughs> Joanne? Yeah. Yes. Okay. The hearing is closed. Okay. It, it was sobering to read that only two facilities in town take public funds. Sobering. I, I I probably would have guessed that, but it was just um, I I missed what your comment was, Suzanne. I'm sorry. That's okay. It was about it. It said in the um, in the synopsis that I believe you you drafted for us that. Um, one of the barriers was that only two facilities in Northampton accept public funding for um, for people to live there. I believe that. I believe oh, that. Amy was, drafted that. I, yeah, I uh -oh. didn't even read that. Um, I believe that's what it said. Um, does, it's not worth it taking the time to review that. But. Uh -huh. Hmm. I've known that about assisted living, but it was um, here. Here it was. Yeah. In 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 black and white. In full voice here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. Okay. So Cheryl Sabara is not coming tonight. We didn't hear back from her. Um. Cynthia, do you, do you want to talk about uh, age-friendly initiatives? And then we'll do um, minutes after that. Sure, um, I'll be really quick. Um, I, I was inspired to look at it, um, the concept of an age-friendly city by two, two sort of um, initiatives. One was at UMass campus, there's something called the age-friendly campus and it's a study. Um, and a questionnaire that's distributed amongst all the UMass campuses about two people 55 and older to assess whether or not they feel that their campus is age friendly. Um, but a more poignant example was a, a friend from New York City came to stay, I didn't even know you could do this, stay at Christopher Heights for two weeks to see how it would be to live at Christopher Heights and how would it be to live in Northampton. And um, she, she's an elderly person and she's in a wheelchair. And she said, I gotta go back to New York City because this is not an age-friendly city. Um, so I thought that was really kind of interesting and just talking with a few people, we talk about sidewalks, we talk about a lot of things. And so not that we have 
pour over the material that I sent you, but um, the World Health Organization um, has really sort of focused on health and aging. Um, and um, I gave you an example of the city of Springfield that has been designated as age friendly, and also an example of a report that, that the city of Northampton did, with, um, which was pretty thorough, and I think it was maybe generated by the planning department. It kind of focused on dementia, aging and dementia. And um, I just thought it would be interesting to see if there were some opportunities um, and I promised Meredith this and Joanne as well, that this isn't anything about have, using the DHS staff or funds or anything, but just to see if there's some opportunities, perhaps for grant funding and kind of assess and look at um, uh, if our community is age friendly. And, um, but with that term analogy, focus more on health. And what bubbles up all the time is housing and transportation and some of the research that I've done. And so we all know that both of those are an issue. Um, so I'm not sure if there's a there there, but um, I'm willing to take a look at it, but I'm kind of willing to take a look at it with somebody else. <laughs> um, and I was gonna I was gonna propose it to Tina Grant and um, only to discover that she responded to me an email from Spain and she said she wouldn't be at the meeting and she wasn't coming back for a while. So I wanted to just kind of see if she would be interested in something like that because she has a real public health preventative background and um and just present something to to the board um you know in collaboration with Meredith and Joanne I mean I think we have a great city um but I think if we can um, look at that report there were many recommendations in that report and not sure if any of them have come to fruition or not the resilience hub was one of them and you know, we've had a lot of opportunity to talk about that. So um, just want to introduce that, see what your thoughts are. I'm perfectly, I have really thick skin about this. And if you say, stay in your lane, shut up, I, I can understand. Um, but just wanted to see what your reaction might be. I was pretty amazed that um, the city of Northampton already has a plan. And it's obviously so much work has already gone into it. Um, I do think that it's worth, um, pursuing that and to see what's in place and what's not in place and maybe coordinate with other other parts of the city other departments and and see what you know what yet needs to be done and and see how that those things could be done um i was very surprised to, to see that there is a sidewalk inventory following on your 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 commentary cynthia um because I, I wondered if this is a public document and where the, whether the plan is available to understand where the investments are going because I, I'm not aware of where they're going and I live downtown. So um, I, and I, I was in a wheelchair once for um, about six weeks and um, it's a very humbling experience to be in a wheelchair in this town. As I said, I, I'm talking about downtown. I'm talking about State Street and Main Street. It's still a humbling experience. Um, and um, then there's the issue of people not shoveling their sidewalks adequately. Um, and it's not unusual at all for us to see uh, wheelchairs going into the street on State Street to, to just to get around town when, it, when there's snow along the sidewalks. So um, that, issue in and of itself was of interest to me. That's that's an issue not only for an aging population, but for people who um, have mobility issues. And I know uh, to that point, Suzanne, we have a city councilor now, Jeremy Dubs. I, I don't know him, but he's in a chair. And um, he made a statement at city council when we had the first snowstorm this year or last year, whenever it was, mm -hmm. and he said, I couldn't couldn't get out. Right. I didn't do anything. I was isolated. So I thought it was interesting in the context of that. Well, I live with a person who, who attacks us with a vengeance. And when she goes walking during the day, she writes down the addresses of all the sidewalks that are not adequately shoved. And sh there is a way to lodge that information with DPW, and she does. She is probably notoriously known in DPW as the not show your sidewalk lady. <laughs> um, but she feels very strongly about that, about the, the, that 
it needs to be safe for everyone to get around town. And, and not just snow, but there's a lot of cracked sidewalks. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's, and, that, that's and I the know ongoing. DPW issue. has a process for that, but I, I'm not, this is, isn't about finger pointing. It's just about trying to see, you know, I think if we could get an age-friendly designation, I, I plugged in Northampton somewhere on some site and it came up with a score of 62 um, out of 100, which is pretty damn good, but I don't know how that was all um, um arrived at but um so anyway it's just an attempt to see what we have that was just the first page of the <laughs> I, um yeah yeah our, our new senior center director kim parks is wonderful and you know she's she's very aware of this document um she is doing things incrementally you know, within the scope of the senior center and helping drive the work in other municipal departments as well, you know, talking about certain font sizes and she's, so she is starting to do the work. She's very much interested in it. And so is our planning department. So if we were going to move forward, I'd really want this to kind of be a small committee with other departments sitting at the table as well. <clears throat> Absolutely. But I think yeah. it's interesting. Mm-hmm. And I, again, I'm not going to do or meet with anybody until, you know, see if Janet's interested. We yep. go through the materials, develop somewhat of a plan, mm -hmm. um, and um, be respectful of everyone that already has, everyone has a little piece of this, right? And if we could pull it all together and show that we are an age-friendly city from very, from a health perspective, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think it, it's, there's, there's so many pieces like that report. I didn't even know it existed. And how did you find it? Where was it? I just, you know, you know Google. how you do those researches. <laughs> so it's, it must be a public document. Sure. 2022, you know, mm -hmm. it wasn't like it was even pre-COVID. <laughs> so we can anyway. call, Sp call Springfield and ask them how they did it. Yeah. Springfield's um, it's another, yeah, another opportunity for us. Well, thank you for uh, finding those documents and uh, bringing this up. I think it's a, a, a good idea for a project and we'll see what we can do. Yep, thanks. And we'll see if it goes somewhere. I mean, thank you. Um, summer schedule. I know a lot of people go away in the summer and um, we had previously said that we would be on the third Thursday, but I'm wondering if we might want to have just one meeting over the summer and maybe take a poll of who's available when. Does that sound reasonable? Unless something urgent comes up. So I will send around um, a doodle poll and we'll see what, um, try to keep it on a Thursday um, and try to see uh, when we get the most people. Is the plan to have the next meeting on June 20th? Yeah, I think we can keep that one. Okay. Um, I, is that sorry? I, I, I have something I would need to reschedule for that, but that's fine. That's okay. And I'm going to be on vacation, so I'm not sure what my... Um, and the, in the, for the June meeting? For the June and July meeting. So I, um, I can dial in maybe if that was a necess necessity. Because it's good to keep, as Meredith keeps telling us, it's good to keep the schedule. So maybe we should just see if people, if we can get a quorum for those summer meetings. I, I don't know. Um, Suzanne, if we had the meeting on June 20th, you would be able to attend? I I could attend, yes. I'll, I'll, I'll cancel my other um, event. Um, and I don't, have, I don't have a problem in July or August um, or September. And Cynthia, you're on the fence about whether you would call in from a vacation? Yeah, yes, I'm on the fence. <laughs> um, all right, well, I'll put out the doodle poll. We'll see if there's any any other dates that are better for everybody. Um, I, won't, I won't be available in August, just to let you know. Okay. Sounds like that's the one that we might want to think about dropping. Giving that one up. Um, okay, well, we'll see how it all shakes out. Um, all right. Um, Meredith, do you want to do a, a little update? 
and then we'll do minutes. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Hold on one second. We could do minutes first. We'll give you a break. Okay. Um, has, there, has everyone had a chance to look at the minutes? Were there any questions? I, I didn't. I didn't have anything to add. Okay. I'm. I'm good. All right. Someone want to make a motion about the minutes from March? Uh, move. It's March, right? Not April. Oh, we canceled April. Yep. Oh, yeah, right. Uh, move to approve the uh, March 2024 minutes for the Board of Health. Second. Questions or comments? All in favor, Cynthia? Yes. Suzanne? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Thank you. Um, oh, there she goes. She's sharing. Okay. Mary, you ready? I'm going to try to get through this. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. It's still uh, under the weather. Mm. <clears throat> <clears throat> what do you see on my screen? Do you see an Excel spree, uh, sheet? Yeah. Okay. The budget. Great. I'll start with our budget. So I have our DHHS budget hearing on uh, at council meeting on May 29th. Um, I'm the first hearing for all departments and then after me is um, the school budget. And then all other departments are on the following night. So lucky me, I get to go right before school. <laughs> That'll be fun. Um, so our budget, I had to reduce a little bit just because of the fiscal crisis that we are in. Um, a lot of our departments were asked to reduce their budget normally. Actually, since I've been here, I think, uh, except for one year, we were allowed to increase our budgets. It's been level funded, but level funded also means you're absorbing um, cost of livings and uh, step increases. So it's really kind of a deficit every single year anyways. But as you can see, and as you all know, because you've been with me most of the time, you know, we went from when I started in 2012, our total budget payroll and O&M was about 110,000. And now um, our total budget is $2.7 million. Um, so throughout time, you know, we've grown in the scope of services we provide, but we've also been able to support that through the budget with the support of the city administration, the mayors that I've worked for. And also a big part of it is the grant funding. Um, you can see, and this is my fiscal year 25 budget that I'm proposing, my total salary, I have 38 positions um, right now for FY25 listed. And the total PNS is $2.5 million. And out of that, $1.4 million is grant funded. So more than, I think it ends up being like 57% is grant funded that I pay for in salaries, which is pretty astonishing. Mm -hmm. and, um, and just to kind of give you a sense, in fiscal year 24, the, the current fiscal year that we're in right now, I've received uh, about $2.6 million in grants total. I'm projecting a little more than that for next year as I'm going after another funding source. So this is the budget that I've put forward. Um, it's 3% lower than my original budget that I proposed, again, because all departments, larger departments are asking to reduce their budgets to help offset some of the deficit in the, in the school budget. So that is where we're at. You see that we have a lot of vacancies. Currently we have eight vacancies and I also have a few staff out on leave. So staff wise, we're hurting, um, but we're still managing and we're still keeping things afloat. Meredith, how do you feel about, I mean, the, the whole grant world is so nerve wracking to me. How do you feel about it? I mean, oh, it's not. It's not nerve wracking. I mean, there are times where um, I get a little uneasy. I I like to have at least three to four years planned out for staffing. I have sustainability plans for all of my grants. And to me, 
it's impressive to think that the first grant that I got in 2015, the first BSAS grant, I still have those same two employees employed. Mm -hmm. So I always, and that funding was only a four year term. So I have been without that funding since uh, I got it in 15, since 2019. So, so how do you do that? You have well, other, grants? I, other grants and Hampshire Hope, really that committee runs by itself without funding. So it's making it part of an institution. So it can carry, the work can carry forward. We have a Hampshire Hope coordinator still that gets funded out of other pots of money because she's doing work outside of the HOPE committee. Um, but yeah, it's about sustainability and being innovative because, you know, um, let's take SAMHSA, you know, the SAMHSA FR CARA grants. They have multiple grants that where the proposals, the RFRs are very similar but you can't keep on putting in the same proposal. You have to be innovative. Something new, a new initiative has to be um, thought of or a new catchment. It, it can't be the same work to apply for the same pot of money. They won't fund you. And then you have to be really good at managing that, that money because if you don't use all of the funding that you're given, you get it, you get a ding, you know, like they need you to use that money because they're being held accountable to another funding source as well. So it's super important that we're managing the money as well. So I, I, I do worry just a little bit, um, you know, but we're, we're always, we're always thinking we're very creative. We're very innovative. Um, and we're always looking for funding sources. And I think this is on the sheet, um, Meredith, but what's the percentage of city fund versus grant funding for the department? So for, uh, so my total budget is 2.7 million and I'm paying 1.4 million in salary. So it's, Point, that'd be 2.8. So it's about 50% is grant funded just in this. But grant funds also pay for a lot of things that you don't see on this, this uh, PNS and O&M budget book here. The only thing that council is interested when it comes to grant funding is personnel. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, you would see in the O and M, you'd probably see another two million. Uh, I'd say maybe not two million. How about uh, one point four million down here in mm -hmm. O and M? But we don't itemize that. Are any of your eight vacancies critical vacancies? I mean, I know they're all important. Yeah. Um. So they are. Um. We, I should say we have seven vacancies because we just hired a shared service coordinator. The shared service coordinator is to run the public health excellent shared service grant that we have. We are um, coming to the end of year three. Um, July 1st is the start of year four. And the types of services and programming that we're doing has just, we've gained leap, leaps and bounds with the types of services and the communities that we're serving. And they want us to weave in DEI and health equity and racial equity, that uh, racial justice, that um, we need that position sooner than later. So we did interview, we did hire, but that person isn't starting. They're starting in June um, on intermittent hours, but won't be full time because they live in Spain right now, won't be full time until August. So that is a critical position. Our community responders, um, I think that's four positions that we have open right now. We're on pause. We just graduated a cohort and out of that graduation class, I think we retained 50% of them. So we have some more vacancies and it's not like we can just have rolling admissions for community responders. We have to find a better way 
to bring in community responders and train them. Otherwise, it's, you know, you have to wait till a new session, a, a new training session is being held, which is very costly, very taxing on our internal resources, not only fiscally, but staff wise as well. So we're trying to figure out another way. I am have been in touch with um, Westfield University. I'm hoping that some college takes on a certificate course for community responders, because it's not just us that's in the same position. We have Cress and Amherst. We have eight, uh, seven, excuse me, EAPS equitable approaches to policing in Massachusetts that are funded through EAPS, through DPH, that are also kind of in the same position. Not that we all have the same training criteria. Ours by far is um, a little more developed and, and intense than the other programs that I know of, but to have a certificate course available on the Eastern side and the Western side of the state would be instrumental. So Western, uh, excuse me, Westfield University is very interested. They audited some of our training. So now it's trying to figure out how we can institutionalize it either there or maybe one of the community colleges because we really cannot be doing this ourselves unless we create a whole training hub, you know, which I thought of, um, but again, it's a lot. And then what's another one of our vacancies? Our, yeah, our DCC coordinator resigned. So that would actually be vacant as well. Um, getting that coordinator's position filled and we have an open dark coordinator. So yeah, they're, they're all important positions, but we're managing. It's remarkable what you've done. <laughs> yep. Just remarkable. Thank you. Thank and you. You, you mm -hmm. wanted to mention something about some grant proposals that you have in? Oh, yeah. So um, due tomorrow, yeah, um, myself and Taylor have been working hard uh, the last eight days on writing a grant for... Um, it's a BSAS grant and it's called the Diversion to Care Grant. The overview is it's to build and enhance local overdose response strategies and service coordination infrastructure, infrastructure by leveraging existing resources and engaging in, in uh, additional individuals who aren't currently using or accessing services. So the first year is to do a sequential intercept model um, which deals how individuals with mental and substance use disorders might be touching the criminal legal system across different intercepts. So that's the year one. And then the following years would be writing a strategic plan on how to address those, those gaps in services. So um, it's, it's pretty cool. We did a, a, a sequential intercept model, I think back in 2019, it's a two-day program. I, I can't remember um, who did it. She ended up leaving for Franklin County working for the justice system out there. But it was interesting um, the first time around, but we would do it now basically just really focused on the criminal legal system and where those touch points are and how we can help people, especially the BIPOC um, community population. Um, to reduce overdoses. So that actually, um, it's one year funding and then it has a term to be funded up to seven years. So that's one grant that we're writing right now that I think that we're extremely well poised to get. So fingers crossed. And if we do get it, then it will start 8-1. Um, Amy is also working on her first grant for the DHHS, which I'm happy to report. Amy, do you want to talk about the um, DEP air quality sensor grant? Yeah, so this uh, came across my emails through a couple of areas, but it's DEP, it's, uh, uh, it's these mini air portable air sensors between we we be allowed between five and ten. It has a um, 
They want to look at the underserved population, so possibly putting them up. I've got about 10 locations that are kind of strategically around, like, you, for example, saying if I could put one up at the senior center, that that would also um, be Salvo. Salvo House is next to it. Cahill is right around the corner, and I, I don't quite have the, the square footage that it covers, but maybe even McDonald House. Um, so there, there is, there's, uh, there are about two hundred ninety nine dollars that are free to us times ten, but there is a cost of, um, you know, the the connections that we we would need. So there's a little piece for us. Um, I've I've looked at like what we could do. Part of the grant is what would we do that, with that information if we were to collect it, and it it would be a little bit of just actually public ed education, and then you know when you look into the grant. You don't just use these air sensors, you use um, other regulatory means of um, seeing what the air quality is. So you, you kind of be leaning on them to, if you, we were to make any kind of um, like a uh, air, air advisory type thing. Um, I'm looking into it just a little bit further because um, Joanne, uh, Jen Brown, our public health nurse, just shared an article about these air sensors from Rich Peltier, who sits on our, our ventilation task force. So I, I started it. I, I, I think it's worthy of um, considering. I haven't finished it yet, um, but he, he has a little concern of, of the, the quality and kind of information in not great information out. So one more piece to it that I, I really want to take a closer look at. But um, we'd also look like, you know, you know, I came up with these 10 locations. They need to be, I picked, I think, seven out of 10 that are our own city-owned buildings. So that gives us great access with, without an ask. Um, places like uh, NHA properties, which are Hampshire Heights and, and um, Florence Heights, which are family-owned properties. And, and we look at if this would give us this information, if we were to get this grant, is there any difference between that property and say, uh, one of my other locations would be like uh, Sheldon Field, it's somewhere that's accessed by young adults, kids, uh, almost you know a good part of the year, but it's also by the highway and it's also by the fairgrounds that holds events. So you're kind of looking at you know what these locations can give us for information. Also, that one happens to be by the river. So I think you have electricity there because that's a, a key part of it. But um, still at the beginning stages, I haven't I haven't put it through yet. But you know that one last step step, I'd really like to look a little closer into Richard what Richard Pelter has to say. Interesting, Amy. Were you considering looking at the environmental justice areas? Con Correct. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so that's mapped out. It's a little um, wonky when you look at the the state maps, but um, I look at you know um, the senior center population, which covers um, Salvo House and our, our Northampton Housing Associations, um, the Hampshire, um, Florence Heights, Hampshire Heights. Uh, what other? I, I uh, it's not a public or Northampton Housing, but Meadowbrook is a pretty big complex, which is all types of living, it's voucher, it's a, a assisted type situation. Um, and it's kind of centrally located. I thought we could put one in maybe both of our fire departments because they're also centrally located. Um, so being able to compare that, uh, the, the senior center also looks, is close to the highway. So that picks up, what does the highway do um, as far as the, the the air that the particulates in the air in, in that location. Um, I don't have them all in front of me, but I, I, I actually thought, I don't think there's any electricity up there. I thought the community gardens would be good because of the, the community that's up there, but it's also adjacent to um, uh, all types of living it, where it's low income, middle income, voucher living and regular housing right next to it. Um, the dog parks kind of all right around there. Lots, lots of activity up there. Not sure if I can get access to electricity though. So, just some ideas. Right. A quick, quick question. That, and thank you, Amy. That sounds great. Um, mm -hmm. the, the opioid survey, the opioid survey for the opioid funds, has that been completed? And do we have a 
a plan for the opioid funds? So we are still in the process. It's a rolling survey. So we're still yeah. gathering the data. We extended um, the time that we're going to start assessing the data to the end of the month because I went in front of council last week. And um, one thing that I didn't think of to help roll out the survey was ask our counselors to send it to their constituents. So I got them that information um, Monday of this week and asked Laura Crutzler, the, the clerk counsel, to get it to the city counselors to distribute to their constituents. So we won't really assess that information until the end of May. And then we'll disseminate it to all of our community partners. We'll look at Northampton's and then we'll look at the aggregate data for Hampshire County as well. Um, we, we moved the funds because the state finally allowed from a stabilization account, which meant every time that I spent funding, I had to go in front of city council to get approval to a different type of fund now that I can, I can spend it without approval, as long as it's within the guidance of, you know, how the community wants it to be spent. Thanks. So I'll have Taylor um, maybe come to our June meeting and can kind of give you a preliminary. I have a rollout distribution plan on what we're going to do um, to let people know about the survey results and coming to the Board of Health is on that plan. So I hope you shared it as well with yep. <laughs> many people that you could. The responses were low. Um, I think we only had 400 responses about three weeks ago. That's countywide. That was pretty low. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're also now working with um, some of our partner organizations like MANA, Providence Place, um, quite a few others, um, the Recovery Center, and... Um, they're giving out gift cards, you know, to have their, the people that they work with um, to fill out the, the survey, because we really want to hear from the people who are impacted by the epidemic, by opiates. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I struggled with it because of my exposure, right? So mm -hmm. I, I, I think the more we can get it out to the those audiences, the better it'll be. And we'll be able to assess the data by that demographic as well. And when we did do the first look, it was very low. The people who use substances or, you know, affected by opiates. Thank you. Okay. Um, do you want to stop sharing? I, I thought I did. I don't know how. <laughs> this whole new... So usually there is a stop share. What do you see right now? We still see your Excel sheet. How about now? It's still see. So did you stop sharing? It disappeared, yeah. Okay, great. I don't know who's hitting the recording. I don't know. Okay. It was me. Uh, <laughs> Thank you for Thanks. confessing, Kelly. Thanks, Kelly. Um, um, anything else before we adjourn? Yeah. No, totally. Want to let you know that um, I don't, you might have read it in the news, but um, we had been working with Northampton Housing Authority um, to outfit all of their properties with Nalox boxes, indoors and outdoors. And it was wonderful. They were great partners. Um, they put on, they put out 31 outdoor Nalox boxes, which contains, I think, nine boxes of Narcan in the outdoor Nalox boxes. And they installed 22 indoor Nalox boxes as well, which contains three to four doses in there on 11 of their properties, which is all of their Northampton properties. Um, Northampton Housing Authority also 
um, takes care of the East Hampton Housing Authority properties, Cummington and Huntington. So that's our next phase is outfitting those properties as well with indoor and outdoor Nalox boxes. Um, so the event was great. I don't remember the date. I think it was maybe May 6th. Um, huge showing of people um, attended, which was fantastic. Um, and I had Kelly right before, always it's right before with me last minute, um, get me some data on when we started becoming a Narcan distribution center, which was in 2017 when I got our first SAMHSA grant um, to let me know how many boxes of Narcan that we've distributed. And at that point, which was you know, maybe 11.55 on May 6th, she told me we distributed 9,506 boxes of Narcan since 2017. And I just think that is astounding. And we've also in the last year um, gotten a lot of our partners signed up and vetted to be part of the Naloxone affiliate program. So they now can order their own Narcan. So our numbers might go down in the amount that we're personally distributing, but we're helping elevate and empower different organizations and communities to order their own. Meredith, please remind me who's paying for the naloxone. It's all free. It was grant funded, right? Mm -hmm. But now it, the state is paying it through their opioid settlement funding. Okay, that, so the state's paying for it, okay. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. that's a chunk of change. Oh, it, I put in, in 2017, our first FR CARA grant was 100000 a year to pay for it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, it was very expensive. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for doing that. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, so I also, we created a map as well where all of the Nalox boxes are in the city. And we've also provided that to uh, dispatch. So if there was a, a bystander who was calling about an overdose, they can quickly assess where the uh, closest Narcan box is. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Another really cool thing that we're doing, um, the Honorable Judge Fine, who I worked with a lot in housing court when I was in Pittsfield and Holyoke. They do all the Western Mass ones, but she's recently retired. Um, anyway, she now is the interim director of the Center for Social Justice at the Western at Western New England University School of Law. Um, she had heard, um, well, there are legal kiosks um in Springfield and she wanted to get some more in Western Mass and the legal kiosks are um, aggregate platforms and content that provide legal information and assistance by facilitating access to the justice system and helping to bridge the divide the digital divide so among the re resources in the kiosks is you can access um mass legal help you can access Legal Resource Finder. You can access Mass Courts, the Trial Courts, Case Management. You can do e-filing, and you can actually do Zoom, um, Zoom Court from the legal kiosk. So it's this really cool thing. And uh, Judge Fine had heard from if there were to be one place, other place in Western Mass to put a kiosk, where would you put it? And multiple people told her the Division of Community Care. So she reached out to us asking if she can put a kiosk there. And we thought, wow, how wonderful is that? And I'm hoping at some point, once we move to the Resilience Hub, that can move with us. But what an honor to have that there. Um, so we're in the we're we're right in the midst of talking this through with um, Judge Fine. I, I can't take that title away from her ever. Um, that's how I've known her for 20 years and getting this to come to fruition, um, which is also good timing because uh, I want to say about a month ago, we kind of treat, uh, we kind of are using our public space in the DCC a little differently. Um, so we're still open in the mornings. People can self-identify, come in, but in the afternoon, we're really, we close the open space in the afternoon to appointment only because 
with everyone kind of dropping in and um, whether they're self-presenting, you know, um, that they have an issue or just coming in for a cup of coffee and using it more of a resource center, even though that's not really the intention of the space that was happening, it could be really loud and we lose privacy. So we thought closing in the afternoon would be a really good thing. It would be open for appointment, op uh, appointment only, or for bringing someone back to do an engagement and find resources, um, we'd utilize it that way as well. So having that space closed in the afternoon, now we can also have the legal kiosk there and that can that can be available and open to the public. So, so what does a legal kiosk look like? Is, is it a computer? Uh, yes, uh -huh. I don't really know everything about it yet. Um, we just, I think Michelle, was meeting Judge Fine today or yesterday and was going to update me on it. Um, so I'm not sure, but I'll let you know. Cool idea. Yeah. But helping bridge that digital, you know, the, that digital divide is, is huge. I know, you know, my many attorneys have clients that can't get on Zoom hearings. It's 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 a real issue. Mm -hmm. It's re really remarkable that uh, the DCC hasn't been open that long, mm. and yet numerous people recognize that and nominated that yeah. as the place to go. That's uh, that's tremendous that the word yeah. is out like that. Yeah, we opened our doors on September fifth, um, and I do actually let me bring up that data. September fifth, we opened our doors. As of May 1st, we have had um, 2,889 engagements. Oh. Of those, 529 are individuals and the 2,360 are repeat engagements with some of those individual engagements. So the DCC staff has been really busy. We are integrating DART responses. So we have community responders who are subject matter experts in, in DART work, post-overdose response work. We used to use um, recovery coaches, but they just really don't exist anymore. There's been funding issues. Um, they're just, they're not around. So we need to, to reimagine what that looked like. And so our community responders, they're all eventually going to be trained um, in DART and post overdose response work, but we hired this new cohort. Half of them were specific for post overdose work, and um, we just doing those DART responses last week. And I think we already have eleven under our belt, which is great. I would add to that, um, that we've intersected with them. We're keeping track of how often we do. Um, one of the responders has reached out to our team and said, <laughs> hey, do you know what's going on with this? And it was amazing how much information he had, but then what we could provide so he could help provide better services. Yeah. Um, one of our senators actually put in a referral to the DCC this week as well, looking for support for a neighbor. That's the one. Yeah. So, yeah. Is state senator or U.S. senator? State. State. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I'm, you know, I have uh, a heavy lift come the 29th to really defend our budget. Um, I feel like we are probably, um, be one of the departments that are going to be scrutinized a little more than others because we have had this exponential growth. We have a new division within our department. Um, so I think like these two new departments, us and Kappa, are really going to um might be a target of, you know, um I don't know. I don't know where I, I lost my thought. I have my medicine head. They're going to be a target because these are new departments where people, you know, who are advocating for the schools are saying, Mayor, you don't care about our children, but you care about creating new departments within the city. So I just want to make sure that people 
really remember, you know, we have short-term memories, um, really remember the work and the care that we have provided all through COVID, the services that we continue to care, all of the uh, public health emergencies that fall on the laps of the DHHS. And so I'm gonna do a little memory jogging in my presentation. Also a little memory jog for the police commission and, and how invested the community was in that. And that the yeah, DCC I'm, I'm I'm going to keep that a little separate because I don't want the um, narrative to be defund the police and give it to the Department of Health and Human Services for the DCC. I really mm -hmm. don't like that narrative at all. Um, but yeah, I'll weave it. I'll weave it in somehow. But yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, I think that's all that was on our agenda. Can uh, I add one thing real quick? Yeah, go. Yeah, just a quick update. Last time we met, we had a presentation on uh, uh, wells, private wells, domestic wells, and you know we kind of landed where are we at. And so I just did just a little bit of work since then, but we do not have local well regulation um, and our DPW, uh, private well regulation and our DPW does not also have one and um they don't even have the difference between the 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 and not to, you know in any fault of theirs they just have never gathered the information of of the difference between which res residents have city water and which residents don't so that would probably be a a good starting point and i also and i have this number but i didn't have it available to me that night um there is a mass.gov uh driller website and what is registered doesn't mean what is actual. There's a, at least 264 wells in Mass, in uh, Northampton. A little bit of an update. More to come. I was going to ask you about that, um, about how we would proceed, because um, our Board of Health members, I not to my knowledge, don't have expertise in this area. So I'm so wondering I, if um, you or your staff would be able to take the draft regulation and make a proposal for what would be appropriate for Northampton and bring yeah, that. I think right now we're still in gathering information, but the, when we have more information, um, I, I can certainly, we can, we can look at that. I think that that's something Meredith and I have talked about in, in turn to also assist in gathering information. And uh, I believe it's Rich Starbird who um, from Recap Solutions, they're very, very helpful in that. There's a lot in the model regulations at the DEP um, level that it, it's not applicable to us. So he can help us weave all that out. And I, I actually, I can't think of it right now, but there was something that came up today that I thought of, oh, I wonder if anyone's even considered it. So again, still just gathering information. So what what does that look like for us, and who 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 does it affect, and 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 you know who should we gather to talk about it and things like that. So I'll, I'll put together a little bit of maybe a, a real loose timeline of what we're going to try to do. Great, thank you. Thanks, Amy. I mean, last meeting we didn't know how many wells we had, so now we know. <laughs> 260 plus. Cool. Interesting. Okay. Um, so as of now, we're scheduled for our next meeting to be June 20th, uh, unless we decide otherwise. Um, would anyone like to make a motion? Move to end the meeting, or maybe you tried to do that, Suzanne. Your mouth was. Thank you. <laughs> I can't shout loud enough to overcome the mute. Thank you. <laughs> second, second, Cynthia's motion. Um, any discussion? All in favor, Cynthia? Yes. Suzanne? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a good night. Thanks,